Greetings. Today we are discussing section 7.2, partial derivatives. Chapter 7 has been all about functions of more than one variable. Chapter 7.1 specifically introduced us to what functions like that look like. And now we're going to get into the real calculus and start asking about rates of change of functions of more than one variable. So for this first video, we're going to tackle more or less these, uh, uh, this, just this first uh, learning objective. We're going to compute and interpret partial derivatives with a couple of examples. Let me apologize in advance to those who are in my class. Uh, these, these first couple of examples are the same couple of examples that we did in our lecture guide in class. So I apologize for not having more diversity in those problems for you in this, this video. So as I mentioned, we're heading away from just the notion of a function of more than one variable, we still need that, but heading into a rate of change in such a function. And our main tool for asking about those rate of change is the derivative, just like it is in the one variable case. But now it gets a special name and it has a little bit more complexity introduced, mainly because now we've got more than one input. We're gonna focus on the case with exactly two inputs because it's kind of the next step up. In theory, we can do this with three or even more independent variables here that, that affect our output, uh, but we'll try to, try to keep those cases few and far between. So partial derivative is, I'm really just supposed to think of this like I would any other derivative. I'm, I'm, uh, it has a slightly different notation, but if we, this were a problem in chapter uh, two or chapter three, we would write this as dz dx, the derivative of z with respect to x. These little kind of script d notation is sometimes called a, uh, is read as del or um, sometimes, or more frequently as just the word partial. So this could be read, for instance, as partial z, partial x. The more concise notation that in my experience with students anyway ch tend to prefer is by naming the function and then using a little subscript with the variable that is uh, that, that gets to change in this particular um, partial. So uh, that's one of the, 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 well, that's the main catch between the one variable case and the two variable case is when we talk about derivatives of a function with more than one input, we really have to specify who it is that's changing and all the other variables are held constant for that, that purpose. So the notation that we like to use for the one variable case was f prime. That's kind of, this is the best analogy we've got of that. It's a little tidier notation. It doesn't involve d's or del's or whatever, but it still has to refer to the variable. We can't get away with just f prime because there are two different variables or more that could be changing here. So there was nothing special about x. We can also change with respect to this other variable, y. And essentially you'll notice the only difference between these two lines is that the variable in the subscript has changed or the variable we're taking the derivative with respect to in the bottom. So partial z, partial y, or f sub y. Both of these things mean take the derivative of this function where y gets to change, but x is held constant. So without actually looking at an example, this is very difficult to make sense of, so let's, let's try one out. Again, I apologize to my class for the, the, using the same, the same problem. So the idea with this partial derivative thing is that uh, this is a set of instructions, just like uh, it is in the one variable case. It's a set of instructions that tells us to take the derivative of whatever is to the right of me. So in this case, the thing that's to the right of that is this e to the whatever expression. And you, thinking about that generalized exponential rule, we've got e to the stuff. The derivative of that is still pretty much e to the stuff, but it's uh, got some more excitement there. So it, most importantly, I can see that this exponent has the variable that we're interested in, x, in it. So since it has that variable in it, we're gonna to have to do a little bit of chain rule. Um, most, more specifically, we're gonna need chain rule on that exponent piece. We need to multiply by the derivative of all this exciting stuff because chain rule notices that this exponent is more complicated than just x and that kicks in this requirement that we tack on its derivative. 
So now the derivative of this exponent piece is sort of a new mini problem. We have a new smaller derivative to tackle. And again, I'll note that, look, there's exactly one place where this variable occurs, the x in this case, and we want the derivative of all this stuff. This is the piece that tends to give folks the most trouble. So the derivative of x squared, that's not a problem. We're used to writing that as 2x. But the derivative of 2y, our brains want to say it's 2. But it's, it's actually not. And the reason for that is what we've run into is the fact that we aren't supposed to let this y, vary, y input change in this case. What this del, uh, this partial with respect to x is telling us is that at the moment, y is held as a constant. And if we were asked to find the derivative of any other constant, we would say, oh, derivative of this thing, if it's not changing, is zero. That's the whole point of a derivative, right? It's a study of a rate of change. If something is constant, it's not changing. So its derivative should be zero. So it, that's the piece that's most counterintuitive for these calculations. To balance things out, we'll look at the derivative of this expression with y as the input and see how that pans out as well. So very similarly though, we'll notice it's e to the stuff and the variable, now it's y, is, uh, is features prominently in that exponent. So we're going to get e to the stuff back again, but then we're going to multiply by the derivative of that exponent piece. Again, chain rule. This time though, the roles of input, uh, the roles of the function that gets to change and the function that's being held constant are flipped. Now y is our variable of interest and x is the thing that doesn't get to uh, change. So this piece right here, as weird as it feels, its derivative is going to be zero. So we've got, <laughs> even though it's got a squared on it, that doesn't really matter. It's a constant being squared. So psychologically, you might replace x with some number in your head, like 3. 3 squared, that's 9. That's some constant. Derivative of 9 is zero. It's not changing. And then flipping the script on this one, the derivative of 2y, since y actually is our variable, results in 2. So these derivatives are not the same as one another, and in general they will not be the same. Uh, we might run into some coincidental cases, but that's not the general case. Let's try out a word problem. Again, I apologize to those in my class that this is the same uh, exciting production function that we uh, are doing in class. So we're going to claim that uh, an automobile manufacturer's productivity is modeled by such a production function. This is the same production function for special cases that gives us the Cobb-Douglas uh, and, and a couple of other interesting extreme models. But for us, this just says if we have K million dollars of capital and L thousand worker hours every year, then this expression tells us how much this uh, uh, manufacturer is going to produce. Our task is to find and interpret the value of this partial derivative. So we are shaking up the function notation a little bit. Notice that p is the name of our function instead of f. k and l are the input variables instead of x and y, but the ordering is still the same. The first one has to be a k value, the second one has to be an l. So first things first, we're going to get ourselves an actual derivative function, just like we do in the one-dimensional case. We need a formula first, and then we'll come back and get uh, plug in numbers to get a, a concrete value. So p sub k is the derivative of this production thing with k as the input. So k is the only thing that gets to change. Just like before, I'm going to try to identify which things have variables in it. And fortunately, we're in a nice scenario where k is uh, only appearing in one spot here. So we've got derivative of all this stuff. All right, so 0.3 out in front, that's not going to affect things very much. The rest of this, we have stuff with our variable in it. As exciting as all those things are, the real focus is that there's k to some power in here. All of that, though, is being raised to the negative 2. It's kind of easy to lose that exponent and all the, the excitement of the rest of these terms. But what we've got is stuff with our variable in it raised to the negative 2 power, which means we have some power rule, or more specifically, the generalized power rule, power rule along with chain rule. So our power rule brings that negative 2 down, takes away one from the exponent. And that's all the power rule piece is really concerned with. But remember that there's more excitement here. All of this stuff 
was the inside of this function. It was more complicated than just k, so chain rule makes us tack on this extra interesting derivative. And what that means is basically our problem has now been reduced to figuring out what this last derivative is. We've, just like in our one-dimensional case, we've taken some big problem, used the generalized power rule, and gotten it down to something simpler. So now all the calculus is focused just on these terms. And again, we have to kind of twist our brain around to make sure that we know which variable is actually changing. And in this case, it's k. And because, and we know that because of this, this partial is telling us that k is the input, or all the way back to the beginning that the subscript said that k was the variable we were interested in. So we're taking the derivative of something that looks like our variable to a power plus some other number that's not allowed to change. So this piece, the portion with the variable on it, is going to have power rule happen to it. We're going to bring the negative 0.5 down. I guess if we take 0.4 and multiply by negative a half, we get this constant. And then uh, we're going to have that exponent get decreased by 1. If you've been doing integral stuff recently, you might get confused. But this power is going to decrease by 1. And then here's where that brain shift happens one more time. The derivative of all this stuff looks like it should be power rule. We have some variable. It's L. It's being raised to a power. This looks like power rule. But because it has no K on it, it has nothing to do with our, the variable that actually gets to change. So that since L is being held constant, its derivative is going to be 0. This definitely takes getting used to. With a little bit of tidying up, putting the constants point, negative 0 0.6 and negative 0 0.2 together out in front, uh, pulling the k to the negative 1 fifth out here, this is just a tidied up version of what we had in the previous line. So we didn't actually want the derivative function as our final answer, although we needed to do that. Now what we really want is to plug in 10 and 6. Now remember that the order of these variables actually does matter. So our first one was listed in the function as k. The second one was listed in l. So we have to make sure we do that with fidelity. So all the k's get replaced with 10s. All the l's get replaced with 6s. And we end up with, I don't know, I don't want to be judgy or anything, not a great number, it's some weird decimal. And so we have computed this. But they also finally asked us to interpret this value as well, which means that all of the numbers that we used, we plugged in 10, we plugged in 6, we got out 0.074, all of those have some practical interpretation within the context of this model. So remembering units, k was millions of dollars, l was in thousands of worker hours, the output of this function was in millions of units produced. So the derivative is saying, look, here's $10 million. This was our k equals 10. We had 6,000 worker hours. That was L equals 6. And then, so the units on this, we, have, we could do a little bit of conversion. The units generally on the, the derivative look like so P sub K is going to look like units on production divided by the units on capital. So units on our output divided by the units on whatever our input was. So in this case, capital was the, the input variable we were letting change. And so this is uh, our units on production originally we're in millions of units. We can, I'll scroll back for just a moment so we can see. It feels like we're undoing all of our good work. So this was millions of units produced. Capital's units were in millions of dollars. So this is millions of units per million dollars. And with some minor adjustment in units, we can see, okay, we'd have 74,000, in other words, 0.074 million additional units produced for every one unit increase in capital. That is, for every additional million dollars in capital that we uh, include. Last is a U-try problem. So here's a good time to pause, and then I'll put up a solution after you've had a moment to try. Okay, I'll assume you have tried this out and are now ready to give it a shot. So just like with our concrete example from a moment ago, we're going to 
start off with the actual derivative and then we'll go back and get ourselves uh, an actual number by plugging in these values. So this says take the derivative of this thing with y as the input. So there's our y squared. Uh, this has a y times e to the stuff and I'm going to try not to get distracted by the e's because the only variable I care about is right there. This is y times a bunch of stuff with x's in it. But that's not any more complicated than y times, I don't know, 7 or y times 12. This has none of the variable that gets to change. So then I just have to ask myself, how does this change as y changes? So I'm going to try to, in my brain, think of this the same way that I would think of y times 12, for instance. The derivative of that would just be this constant. It would just be 12. So the derivative of this is just the constant e to the negative x squared. It definitely takes some, some uh, conditioning, let's say, to make our brains work this way. And then f sub y, we would plug in, we remember the order, y's are second, so there's our one. We would take a zero and plug it in for our x values. So this would be two minus e to the zero. In other words, two minus one. And there's our answer. We'll see you for video number two shortly.